Hey everyone, this is Kenji. I'm at home and I'm uh, going to show you how to break down a chicken today. Um, and we're also going to make some chicken stock. Um, now, there are multiple ways to break down a chicken, so I'm probably going to make this video more than once. But today I'm going to show you sort of like the classic way. We're going to end up with two airline chicken breasts. Uh, we're going to end up with a couple of wings. We're going to get end up with um, drumsticks and thighs. And we're going to end up with a carcass that we can use for stock. So, start off. You have your chicken here, right? You got your neck here. The neck we can go right into the pot for stock. Um, what I really like to do first, um, well, wash my hands because I just touched the raw chicken. What I generally like to do is before I even begin, um, there's going to be a few points in here where you want either a kitchen towel, if you don't mind it getting raw chicken on it, um, or what I do is I use some paper towels and what I do is I tear them off and have them ready here so that I don't have to handle the roll of paper towels with chicken coated hands while I'm going. All right, so I got my, my towels here. Um, two different knives. You want one sort of big heavy duty thing. I got a cleaver. You can also just use a heavy duty chef's knife, one knife, one that you don't mind getting beat up. Um, and then a sort of more pre precision knife. It can be a light chef's knife. It could be a boning knife. Um, it could be any, you know anything that's sharp and maneuverable. So to start, we're gonna take the sharp knife, slit the skin just a little bit above each leg like that. And then we pick it up by both legs and you kind of twist them until the bone pops out right there. You see, very easy. And then holding it by the leg, you kind of go in through here and right back here, you can see there's this little chunk of meat that's called the oyster. You want to make sure that comes with you. So you cut all the way around the oyster and then you should be able to slip the knife very easily into the joint. And there you've got one leg, and then on the other side, you do the same thing. So make sure you pick it up, hold it by the leg. You get under that oyster so that it comes with you. And there you go. Got a second leg. Now, if you want to break these down into a drumstick and a thigh, you can feel right where it bends. Your knife should be able to slip right in through that joint. And there you go. You've got now a drumstick and a thigh. Let me get a, uh, what can I use here? I'll throw everything onto this second board for now. Again, you feel. Oops, and sometimes you miss, and that's fine. There you go. Right through that joint. You'll know when it's when you're in the right space because your knife will go through with very little force. If you feel like you're really jamming or like going up against a bone, it's probably because you are going up against a bone, which means you want to kind of reposition your knife. All right, so now we got this. Now, so to get an airline chicken breast, what you do is you hold it by the wing like this, pick it all the way up, put your knife right here, about half, so this is the wing joint, uh, the uh, the first, first wing joint, you put your knife about halfway through, slit through the skin, and then with your knife pushed against the bone, you just kind of spin the whole chicken around. Okay, until it's cut all the way through. And then what you can do is you hold here, you hold the chicken here and you flip it backwards like this. And the wing pops right off, leaving you with this nice little sort of clean bone here. Okay, and then you can do the same thing on the other side. Just like that. Flip it back, wing comes right out. Next what we want to do is we want to get rid of the, um, the wishbone. You don't have to get rid of the wishbone, but I find it makes the rest of this much easier to do. So the wishbone is like, so you have it here, the breast side facing up, okay? The wishbone is the Y-shaped bone that runs, so this is the keel bone right through the center of the breast, and the wishbone attaches right here in this kind of Y-shape. So what you want to do is you want to lift up the skin and feel for the bone and then run your knife tip along the top of that bone, just like that. And then run it underneath the bone, like that. And then do the same thing on the other side. Okay, now here's where you use your first towel. So actually, once it's done like that, you can feel, get your fingers, you see, you got my, I got my fingers behind it. There's one side of the bone and there's the other side of the bone. I got my fingers behind it there. And I can pull it forward. Oops, and if it breaks, you make a wish. Pull it forward, and then this this part of it pops right out. And then what you do is you take your first towel, you use it to get a grip, and it comes right out. That's one side of it, and I'll get the other side now. It's totally fine if it breaks. It's also totally fine to leave it in there. It just makes butchering the next bit a little bit easier if it's if it's out. 
All right, there's the other side. So this is what the full bone looks like, just like that. You see it's a Y shape. That can go into the stock pot. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut our airline breasts out. So we got, <clears throat> our, we got our keel bone here. We take our sharp knife and we run it right along one side. Um, I usually do it along the left side first. So run it along the left side there, okay? And then you can actually just use your thumb to kind of push the meat away from the bone. Okay, and then once you get down to this little last bit, you can use your knife again. And if you're uncomfortable with, you know, pushing, pushing raw chicken meat with your thumb, you can do the whole thing with the knife. It doesn't really matter. Um, and what we're looking for, you see how this, this joint rotates right there? We want to make sure that we find that, find that rotation on the inside, which is right over here, and get our knife in between that, bone, that bo joint and the carcass. And you end up with this, which is an airline breast. We can trim off this little excess skin here. Um, airline breast plus a tenderloin. Let's put that over here. Um, and with this guy, we do that little Jacques Pepin trick where um, we take our towel again, a clean towel. Um, we first expose just a little bit of the end of that ligament there, you see? That little, little little ligament right there. And then what you do is you grab the end of it with your towel and you just, oops. You don't grab the uh, paper towel, you hold there. And you can just hold down and then scrape off the meat. And there you get a chicken tender with no ligament in it. And then that ligament comes right off here. Okay, and now for the second side. Second side's always a little bit harder to do um, just because it's not balanced, but you basically do the exact same thing. So the knife along one side of the keel bone. You follow the contour. Here, I'll do this one with the knife so you can see without doing the thumb thing. Just follow the contour of the bone with the tip of your knife. Okay. You find that little joint here, which is right, oh, see how this moves here? And then you can find the other side of it inside there. It's right here. Okay, let me see if I can show you more closely. So this is moving like that, right? And then over on this side, you can see where it meets right here. You see right there is where it meets. There's like a little ball and socket joint. So you make sure your knife gets in between that, that joint right there. You got it? And then you get your second airline breast. Um, this one, see the tenderloin is still attached. You can leave the tenderloins attached if you want. Um, or you can take them off. Oops, that one kind of mangled a little bit. Anyhow, that's how you that's how it comes off. And you get your second airline breast there. What do we got here? We got wing, wing, thigh, thigh, drumstick, drumstick, breast, breast. Um, you don't need a boning knife, by the way. Um, so let me show you what a boning knife is real quick. Let me just get my hands. Do I have a boning knife? Oh, I don't know where my boning knife are. Well, this is similar to a boning knife. So a boning knife is something that looks like similar to something like this. Usually a boning knife will actually have, this is a, full, a fish fillet knife, um, but a boning knife is pretty similar. Um, a little bit flexible, you know, very, very sharp and thin blade so you can easily get in and around all the bones. Um, and it usually has a little heel which you use for kind of scraping bones, like Frenching things. Um, you don't need a boning knife. I remember once when I was a, uh, working at Cook's Illustrated, we used to do all these guides for, you know, the best knives, whatever. We were at an editorial meeting, um, we were trying to figure out what to do for the next equipment test, and I, su I suggested doing a boning knife. Um, and so this was at the all staff editorial meeting, you know, so it's like, at the time it was probably like 30 of us sitting around a table, um, and then the 
I, I won't say his name right now, but um, the <laughs> calls in from his house and <laughs> um, uh, for these meetings. And I remember suggesting, saying, hey, what about if we do boning knives? And, uh, and then he said over, over the conference phone, I don't know about you, Kenji, but at my house, we don't do a lot of boning. Um, anyhow, it was funny. People, people silently cracked up. Nobody laughed out loud. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm gonna have an immature sense of humor. But anyhow, so what you can do is you can take your chef's knife or not, in this case, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a cleaver. We're gonna prep this carcass for stock. First, what I do is I lift it up, open it up so that the backbone's on one side and the breastbone's on the other. And then I just kinda chop right down the middle. Just like that. And then I kinda roughly chop it up like that. You really don't need to be precise at all. Um, the only goal here is to kind of increase uh, surface area a little bit for more extraction when you're making your stock. That goes right in there. Okay, now I'm gonna do a bunch of random aromatics that I had in my fridge. A leek. Really, you can do whatever you want. Um, you know, the basics are you want something kind of oniony, so an onion or a leek or scallions. Um, this is a kind of Western style stock, so I'm using uh, onions, leeks. I'm gonna leave the skins on, I don't mind them. Uh, carrot. And some celery. I'd say at the very minimum, you want the uh, onion in there. Um, everything else, kind of optional. Um, onion, carrot, celery are the sort of classics, the mirepoix. Uh, and then I also got some uh, thyme from the garden, a few bay leaves, and some black peppercorns. And that's it. Um, if I was doing like a Chinese style stock, like a simple home style Chinese stock, what I would do is um, I would do some scallions and ginger in there. Um, <clears throat> or if I was doing a Chinese superior stock, I would do chicken, I would also add some pork bones, I would add some ham, and then I would add some dried seafood like flounder. Uh, and if I was doing, say, a stock for something like, um, I don't know, like a hot and sour soup, like a hot and sour Thai soup, I would probably add some lime leaves in there. Uh, I would add some lemongrass. So, you know, stock is really, really whatever you want to do. Um, the important part is that it tastes good and you, and you use what you have on hand. It's not, it's not something you should be making a shopping list for necessarily. It's really, um, you know, stock is something that you should be making out of odds and ends. It's really sort of a, a, a kitchen efficiency and, and frugality measure more than anything else. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is just going to bring it to a simmer. And if you want to, you know, if you want like a super clear broth, what you can do is bring it to a simmer and then dump it all out, um, sort of wash the bones and that sort of gets rid of some of the impurities. Um, I never bothered doing that. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring it to a simmer and then I'm just gonna skim it every once in a while. So there's uh, proteins and um, scum, like like minerals and stuff that come, that leach out of the bones um, that you don't necessarily want in the stock. And so what happens is um, they form like a scummy, bubbly layer on the surface which you'll see and you just kind of skim it off and go you don't honestly you don't even really have to skim it off um all it does is it'll make your stock a little bit sort of cloudier and a little bit not quite as clean tasting which i don't think is such a big deal anyway um at a restaurant you would have sort of like a big big pot of chicken stock simmering on the back of the stove uh and basically you know you're trained that at any time you walk by it if you're cooking um if you're on the line anytime you walk by the stock pot and you see that there's any sort of fat or impurities on the top you would skim it off so it kind of gets regularly skimmed off it's kind of a group chore that everyone in the kitchen would participate in uh, as it goes. Um, a chicken stock only needs to simmer for maybe two hours or so, two, three hours. Uh, something like a veal stock with a lot more uh, gelatin that you want to extract, uh, that you, uh, sorry, collagen that you want to extract and turn into gelatin, something that's going to give that rich texture and mouthfeel. Something like a beef stock or a veal stock, uh, you would let it simmer for more like, I don't know, eight to 12 hours, sometimes even 24. Um, of course, you can continue simmering a chicken stock until uh, the bones really almost completely break down and that's what becomes known as sort of a bone broth. Um, that's what sort of a, a, a thick chicken, um, a python chicken broth, a, a ramen broth made out of chicken would be like you simmer it until the bones start to break down uh, and you really fully extract all the minerals and all the protein and everything in there and it turns into a sort of rich cloudy stock. So that's just a, um, you know, a, a rich stock, a rich stock is what people call bone broth these days, even though it's been around for a long time. Um, all right, so now I got my chicken parts here. Um, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw this chicken wings in the stock also because I don't think I'm gonna use them for anything. Um, and they're gonna add some nice gelatin. So the more connective tissue uh, that a piece of meat has, um, so that's, you know, like the tendons and the ligaments, 
Um, also the skin, uh, the more connective tissue in there, the richer it's gonna make the broth. Um, and so chicken wings actually make for a nice rich broth. So do chicken feet. And I think that's the end of this video, huh? Um, at some point I'll show you how to cook these airline chicken breasts, maybe tomorrow, uh, and then we'll do some stuff with the drumsticks and the thighs as well. Um, yeah, thanks for coming by, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, um, sorry, before I go, let me quickly show you um, a good way to freeze your chicken. So when you're freezing anything, um, so the enemy of freezing is thickness. You want things to freeze quickly because you don't want there to be a big differential between the center and the edges. So if the edges start to freeze um, and the center is still raw, as it sort of works, it slowly works its way in, it ends up rupturing a lot of cells. Um, and that means that when your meat then defrosts, uh, it um, loses a lot more moisture. So what you want to do is you want to freeze as quickly as possible, which means getting things into a thin layer. Um, so what I do, for example, if I'm going to freeze my chicken breasts, I get them into a bag that just fits them like this. Um, and then here's the trick for getting most of the air out if you don't, you know, you could cryovac these, of course, but you don't have to. Um, here, you close the bag up so that just a little hole is remaining here, and then you take a little bucket of water and you lower it in. And what happens is, this is called the water displacement method, and what happens is, as you push it in, the water forces the air out. Um, and then just before that last bit goes underwater, you seal it off. And you end up with um, you know, not completely air-free, but a very, very tight, almost air-free seal. Um, and that's great uh, because, it, well, air is what, exposure to air is what gives you freezer burn. Um, freezer burn is, is uh, sublimation, so when ice transitions directly from a liquid to a solid, that's called sublimation. Um, you know, it doesn't turn into water first, and that's what, ha that's what gives you freezer burn. And it, in fact, that's, that's also what goes into the, um, the freeze-drying process. Um, <clears throat> That, that's how the freeze drying process works. They uh, intentionally cause sublimation um, by putting a vacuum on frozen, um, on frozen foods. But it's not good for your chicken. Um, and that's how you end up with freezer burn, how you end up with the sort of weird, weird uh, fibrous sections of your chicken um, or meat or whatever it is. So dry off the bag. Here's the other trick. Put it on an aluminum baking sheet. Um, aluminum is a very good conductor of heat. So when you take this and then place it into the freezer, um, the aluminum conducts a lot of heat away from the chicken so that it freezes faster. Um, similarly, when you're thawing, whether it's thawing chicken or thawing steak or thawing anything that you want to thaw, if you put it on an aluminum baking sheet, it'll thaw about twice as fast as if you just leave it on the cutting board. And that's very important for when you're freezing things. Um, so what I do is I put it in, um, I'll let it... <clears throat> Let it freeze in a single layer. And then once it's completely frozen, take it off the baking sheet and just store it however the hell you want it. Um, all right, now I'm really going. See you next time. I'm gonna skim that chicken stock now. It's been simmering for two hours, three hours. We got a little sidetracked on my daughter and I went fishing from her wagon. We caught megalodons. Um, I'm just gonna give it one last final skim. So this is like most of the gunk that I've been pulling off as it goes. I have, um, as I mentioned, I was out of the house for like an hour. I know some people are scared to leave things simmering on the stovetop while they're out of the house. Um, I'm not that scared. As long as you keep it on low enough of a simmer. All right, that's about good enough. So now I'm gonna take this and all I'm gonna do is go through a fine mesh strainer. Um, if you have like a chinois, you can do that too. I got a chinois, I might. If I want to get it super clear, I might pass it through that later. Um, a chinois is like the pointy, tall pointy guys with the really fine mesh on them. Um, they're also kind of expensive, so I don't think you necessarily need to have one. There we go. Um, I'm going to let this drip, drip down like that. Um, and by the way, these carrots and stuff uh, make excellent, excellent dog treats. Um, but there you go. That's all. That's chicken stock. So out of like one, this was like a two and a half pound chicken, a pretty small guy. So out of one chicken, I get about a little over a quart of, of pretty rich chicken stock. This will be rich enough that I think it'll um, turn into, uh, you know, become gelatinous as it sets. Um, you could also then com continue to reduce this, put it back on the stove in a skillet, very, very slowly reduce it, skim it well as it goes so that there's no fat in it um, and reduce it down into a sort of a chicken jus, which is sort of like a gelatinous, thick, really nice mouth coating sauce that's excellent for chicken. Um, but what I'm gonna do with this one, I'm gonna save it. We're gonna use it uh, in a pan sauce for those chicken airline breasts that we took off earlier. So that'll be a different video for another time, but 
It's good to see you all again. See you later. Bye.